the access. Now we move into different horizon of structural interventions, and there is so much which is happening on the mitral valves and the tricuspid valves. And so we have some of the best exponents of these uh, techniques. Today they will discuss threadbare, step by step, how these procedures are to be done. So for this session, may I invite amongst our experts, Dr. Pradeep Yadav. Pradeep, please join me. Dr. Anup Agarwal, Dr. Horst Sievert, Dr. Eberhard Grube. Eberhard, would you like to join us? All right. And uh, Dr. Ravinder Rao is also going to be uh, delivering the lecture first. You're doing both of us, both the metal well, or is Sai around? Okay, so we'll start with the TMVR, yeah. and if Sai doesn't show up. Hmm? Sure. May I also invite Dr. Puneet Verma, Dr. Rajesh Jindal, Dr. Rajneesh Malhotra, Dr. Ramji Malhotra, all both very senior surgeons in our, in our city. Dr. Vijay Sinha, Dr. Subhash Chandra, my ex-colleague, I just saw him here. Subhash, he's finishing his tea. Yeah. Dr. Vivek Tandon, Dr. Prashant Bharadwaj, and Dr. Samir Gupta. Samir, please come over, join. So we'll, we'll have now a uh, focused, technique-based, hardware-based session to learn from the masters. First, we have a presentation. So uh, Dr. Ravinder Rao is going to talk about TMVR. And uh, after that, we have a presentation on the mitre clip, right? Come. Good afternoon, everyone. So TMVR valve in valve. Uh, because it's a case-based talk, so I'm going to share a case. 70-year-old 70 lady, hypertensive, diabetic, prior cardiac surgeries two times, 27 millimeter St. Jude epic valve in 2009, severe bioprocessory valve regurgitation, moderate tricuspid <coughs> regurgitation, pulmonary artery hypertension, RARV enlarged with normal RV functions, atrial fibrillation, signs of right heart failure, frail, STS score of 9.2, <laughs> surgical <laughs> turned off for valve replacement. You can see this patient has got severe tricuspid regurgitation. Yes. I think the slight change. So our plan was a TMVR valve in valve, safety and transeptal ASD closure if required, and a stage cable valve implanting. So it was already highlighted uh, very important for CT scan assessment is very important for our, uh, mitral valve interventions. Uh, I think it was also discussed in one of the earlier presentations. We need to look at the. Uh, Neo LVOT, the interaction of the mitral valve uh, with the aortic valve, LVOT, anterior mitral leaflets. But for a valve in valve procedure, the anterior mitral leaflet is already, already resected. So these are the CT scan assessments. Then we also look at the septum, uh, how the septum is in relation to the uh, plane of the mitral valve. And you can see a uh, TE which shows a uh, degenerative bioprosthetic valve. So a pre procedure TE is also important. We need to rule out any paravalvular leak. Uh, and we need to identify the etiology of the uh, bioprosthetic valve failure. Transeptal puncture, very important when we do a transeptal puncture for a TMVR valve in valve, it has to be an imaging guided transeptal puncture, though there is a recent paper published from Cleveland Clinic where they have done TMVR valve in valve minimalistically without TE and under fluoroscopy. But the important thing is the plane of the septal puncture and uh, where you're going to cross the valve uh, has to be uh, visualized on TE as well as in fluoroscopy. So uh, on TE, we want to be right in the mid septum and maybe slightly posterior, but it is the fluoro is also very important. Before you puncture, uh, you see whether uh, the tip of the needle is at the center of the bioprosthetic valve plane. So you go to the RAO, make the bioprosthetic valve into a straight line because the TMVR valve in valve is a bulky device and if you are very high on the septum, it's going to be difficult for it to take a turn down. So lower or a middle part of the septum is what is important. Whatever puncture system somebody is, one is comfortable with, I always use a, a SL1 sheath and a BRK needle and then a standard transeptal puncture and an 8.5 French edgeless sheath with JR catheter across the valve 
and put the Confida or the Safari wire into the LV. Then we did a 10 by 4 balloon septostomy. This is very important, but this is a sapien valve. The valve was not crossing. So uh, what was the etiology? At this point, we looked at the, um, uh, the surgical note. I think we were very late in looking at the surgical note. The approach for the mitral valve was a right atrial approach. So when a surgeon does a right atrial approach and while coming back the septum, they put sutures or the septum can be thickened. So we went, we went back and we did a balloon dilatation of the septum with a bigger size, with two balloons. And then uh, this is advancing an inflated balloon, which is called flossing. So you advance an inflated balloon. It goes across the septum and into the valve. So this also tells you how the direction of the transcatheter valve will be, whether it's going to hit the top or bottom end of the frame. So uh, we always do this flossing. Uh, now we inflate the septum with a 12 or a 14 mm balloon. So this balloon was only 10 mm. We hope that because it's a 23 millimeter valve, patient has got RA, RV enlarged. Uh, we were hoping to avoid a right to left shunt, but eventually the valve didn't cross. So we ended up doing a bigger balloon dilatation. Next, it's standard, the valve position. Uh, you position the valve in such a way that it is not too atrial. That's very important. If the valve is too atrial, the valve can migrate into the LA on the table, or also there are case reports where the valve has migrated um, at a later time. So the valve is more ventricular, and we try to flare up the LV end of the valve. This is standard. You do a rapid pacing, a very slow inflation, And sometimes we have to push the, on the catheter on the fly to make it 90 degrees to the plane of the mitral valve. A 3DT is very important or essential and helpful if it is there. Uh, we always use a 3DT uh, for our valve and valve procedure. So this is the echo post procedure. You can see a mean gradient of 4 millimeters of mercury. No um, uh, a paravalvular leak, no valvular leak. But this patient also, remember this patient had a uh, right atrial and right ventricular enlargement, severe tricuspid regurgitation, but normal RV functions. So we ended up doing an ASD closure for the septum. 12 millimeter ASD device was used. So how, how do we assess this uh, ASD? As we said, one is saturation. Then you also assess the uh, shunt right to left, left to right, or a bidirectional shunt. And in patients with severe tricuspid regurgitation, sometimes the jet goes to the direction of the uh, septum and we ended up closing this septum with a ASA device. So uh, then this patient member also had a tricuspid regurgitation. We did not have a, a, a triclip or those other therapies for the tricuspid valve. The one therapy which was available in India was the trick valve. Hemodynamic tracings uh, put a wire in the right pulmonary artery. So right pulmonary artery acts as a landmark for the junction of SVC to RA. And then we ended up putting a trick valve, uh, one, one which has an SVC component and one with an IVC component. So you see the IVC component is placed and you put a catheter into the hepatic vein, into the hepatic vein angiogram. And this is how it looks like. So the, uh, uh, the I IVC valve and uh, the flow in the hepatic vein is not obstructed and the hemodynamics, this is the pullback hemodynamics. So in this particular patient, uh, we place the IVC uh, valve first and then we stage the SVC valve at a later date because we were also trying to understand how these cable valves behave. Uh, thank you very much for the kind attention. Comments? I think that was a very interesting case. Um, Obviously, the valve in, in, in mitral is, um, poses some challenges, uh, and you pointed those out. <clears throat> the the transeptal puncture has to be taken carefully, and um, obviously, all the important steps in order to deploy this, um, you, you mentioned. Interesting that you mentioned the trick valve. Um, I, I have some mixed feelings, or I, I should say I did have some mixed feelings. Uh, about it because this approach has been around for quite a while and um, after the initial after the initial um, results uh, we lost a little bit interest in this approach uh, maybe wrongly so um, because we thought it was not addressing 
the, the cause of the problem on the tricuspid valve. However, I have to say, um, I, when, I, when we did a case in, in Sao Paulo where the valve is approved, no other valve uh, or no other approach for tricuspid is approved in Brazil, we used a trick valve, and now we have one year results of five trick valve cases. <clears throat> I don't know whether that means a lot, but at least it's worth being mentioned, the results are just excellent. The patients um, didn't come back. They were on maximum medical therapy, and um, the, uh, the, the, the patient is, remains in very stable conditions, reduced, so it does have some value, maybe more end stage uh, than, um, than early on. I don't know, but I think it's an interesting, very interesting approach. Um, so we listen carefully now to all these cases. Actually, we will do one case for TCT, and um, we'll see what the results are. But I think it's a very interesting combination that you corrected the left side and the right side uh, with a possible means. I think it's very well done. Congratulations. Thank you. And I think uh, we also have the same sentiments regarding the trick valve, though we have a very small experience. Uh, I would not <coughs> offer to it to my patients. This is sometimes, you know, these patients read up on internet and they would come for a palliative therapy. So at present, I would tell my patients that I don't know how much it's going to help you. We will only know with time. Yeah. Uh, Ravinder, maybe two words on your sizing of your valves and the placement of the valves. So uh, the, trick, uh, the sizing of the mitral valve is based on the previous surgical valve. So that's very <coughs> standard. But for the trick valve, uh, there are only two valves. So I, I'll, you size based on the SVC and you also size based on the IVC at the level of hepatic vein. But positioning is very important. The SVC component, you know, it is positioned at the junction of SVC RA or slightly higher. How do we know on fluoroscopy? You put a catheter in the right pulmonary artery. So right pulmonary artery serves as a landmark for the SVC RA junction. So there's a belly, or, there's called belly in the valve, which you place it in the SVC part. And in the IVC component, you put a catheter in the hepatic vein. So there's a skirt. And you know, if the hepatic vein is too large, you can partially cover the hepatic vein. So it can be a challenge sometimes to position the IVC component because there's a very small uh, distance from the hepatic vein to the IVC RA junction. I don't know what is your... Pradeep? Uh... I was going to say, um, you know, a lot of these heterotopic valve implantation started with KV, yes. right? The KV technique where you would put a <laughs> large stent in the IVC at the RA IVC junction and then put a sapien in. It was very, very hard and challenging to deploy that stent in the IVC, would want to migrate in the RA, and then you're trying to hold it down. Edwards now have a dedicated stent called VDOC. It's uh, being investigated in the early feasibility study. It's a de dedicated stent designed for that RA IVC junction uh, with the intent that you'll deploy a sapien inside it. So it's being studied as a EFS called right flow. Just a question regarding the ASD closure. Uh, do you do this always or no. making decision upon the hemodynamics or what is your approach? So uh, just two cases which I can think of in my uh, small experience where I have done an ASD closure. One is this and one was a mitra clip case. Uh, I would look at the saturations and the shunt. So if the patient desaturates and the T shows a right to left shunt or a bi-direction shunt, <coughs> or uh, like this patient had an RARV enlarged and severe tricuspid regurgitation. These are the only three scenarios where I would go ahead and do an ASD closure. But I would be happy to uh, listen to your thoughts. Well, we usually don't close it because they close spontaneously. By the way, we start always with a 40 millimeter balloon, not with a 10. And uh, I mean, in this particular case, it's an important question because when you implant the trick valve, I'm assuming the right atrial pressure will be higher, and then you end up with a right to left shunt, and this yes. also implies some risk for paradoxical emboli and so on. Yeah, so this, this particular case, we had planned it up front that there's a high possibility we'll end up closing the ASD, and that's why we wanted to go with the small valve. But thank you very much. I think those are very important points. A uh, word from the surgeons you know, for future mitral valve implants, keeping a TMVR in mind, uh, what are your thoughts on that? So, uh, Dr. Roy, it was really good um, presentation, um, and I would say it's a good, I would say it's a future, uh, this is what we are going to see more and more. 
and we was as surgeons also whenever we have to have a I mean I would say redo situation in the mitral we always have started now looking for the options that what are options available and we can always have well win well uh, the one question I just wanted to ask you um, this um, does it make a difference to you whether it is a porcine or a bovine surgical valve there so uh, yes uh, what I have seen the porcine valve uh, the leaflets <coughs> The way porcine valve fails in majority of cases by tear of a leaflet. So we see severe mitral regurgitation and sometimes they come with acute MR, especially the epic valve. The bovine valve is a gradual degeneration, which is calcification. So it only makes a difference if the new LUOT is very small. Now the, the bovine pericardial leaflets are a little taller and they can cover the frame and can cause a new LUOT obstruction. But the porcine valve leaflets, when they fail, they get retracted. So technically, I'm just thinking uh, it doesn't make a difference, but the new LUOT size uh, uh, calculation will be important. But yeah. one, one thing which I want to highlight is here, bioprosthetic valve can present with acute severe AR, especially the uh, post time valve. Yeah. So what this is what I was wondering, because uh, the previous generation um, pericardial valves, which we called as perimount and the bigger valves, when you are putting valve, you know, the, the chances of LBOT obstruction will be very, very high. That's right. Whereas the porcine, you said porcine, are, I mean, the leaflets, if you look at it, they are very, I mean, very fragile, very frail. I mean, and that they, they can be really, very easily opened up. So I would always, I mean, think that the, one has to really take into the consideration when you are putting a uh, uh, previous generation pericardial valve, which is like peribound or these kind of valves. That is one issue. The other issue is that uh, porcine valves generally have smaller true IDs. So when you're putting your sapien in, you're more likely to put a smaller valve. <coughs> Edwards pericardial valves, they generally will give you a little bigger true ID. So something else to consider. And hopefully, so, I think <laughs> there are expandable valves coming out. Both on the surgical side, right? Inspiras for the aortic, and yeah. I think Mitris is for the mitral side, which you can expand it so that you don't need like bioprosthetic valve fracture type pressure. Even at low atmosphere, you can expand those surgical valves. Yeah. So we have these valves available now in India as well. So we have started implanting. So I've implanted a couple of them, the Mitris. Mm -hmm. So which is, I think, going to be the future for these valves. Right. Dr. Subhash, you want? Yeah. So excellent, uh, Dr. Rao, as always and you have clubbed this uh, tricuspid therapy with your uh, valve and valve. My only comments are about the tricuspid therapy because I happen to use a uh, trick valve, one of my very advanced TR patient. And when I hear Dr. Grube sharing his experience that his five of his patients have done very well, um, I'm not sure that at what point you pick up these patients to employ the therapy. Perhaps in our experience, these patients have very advanced uh, TR and physiologically doesn't explain the point that you're just converting the whole right ventricle and right atrium into one chamber. And the majority of patients have perished here too soon early after this therapy. So I think point of intervention in terms of the TAPC and the RV function is very important when you embark upon doing the tricuspid valve therapies. No, I, I think totally agree, sir. Once we have leaflet therapy, I think that will be the treatment of choice. That's it. <coughs> Does the RV function matter in choosing your... RV function is very important, yeah. So, so if RV, fu RV function is not normal, the trick valve will not help. <coughs> yes, so RV function has to be normal. So the taxi has to be in excess of 13. Now, on a lighter note, why they have called it a trick valve? Is it a trick or something or why do you call it a trick? <laughs> Well, as I said, I, I tell patients this is palliation. I don't even know how it's going to work for you. So yeah. if you want, we can help you. But your point was very right. We are treating these patients very late in the natural course of history, their disease. Because we all try to keep them on diuretics because there is no definite therapy. So, yes. so thank you so much. And uh, Ravinder, would you move on to the next mitral therapy uh, for... Uh, the new clip that we have. So, uh, you know, I, this talk was supposed to be given by Sai Satish. Yeah. Uh, Sai is not here. Sai is a very experienced uh, mitra clip operator. And uh, we all acknowledge it that he has done highest mitra clips in the country, uh, which, has, which has been above 50. And he's trying to salvage his computer, which crashed. <laughs> yes. But, you know, um, I'll share my mitra clip experience. Uh, 
pardon me my first slides because I'm just pitching in for the last minute. New therapy for heart failure, we all know about mitraclet, we all know about the COAP data, we also know about uh, uh, how mitraclet uh, helps in patients with functional mitral regurgitation. But I want to focus more on D and why D, D is very important for, to, for us to understand the diagnosis of mitral regurgitation. Is it functional MR? Is it degenerative MR? Then we need to assess the mitral apparatus and then whether the patient is feasible, whether the procedure is feasible for the mitral clip and the D during the mitral clip. Degenerative mitral regurgitation, we all know about it. It's a disease of the leaflet, papillary muscle, or the annulus. It can be a prolapse segment, flail segment, and every function is normal. Functional mitral regurgitation, that's what we are going to focus more on because if you look at the COAP trial, uh, those are the type of patients which we treat in our country. Very rarely we get a degenerative mitral regurgitation for mitral clip because degenerative MR can be better treated by surgery until unless there is a surgical contraindication. So mechanism of functional mitral regurgitation, here you can see on T, it's mainly the uh, disease of the LV. Uh, there is leaflet tethering, there is central MR, there's an LV dysfunction, dilated LV, and sometimes there can be a disease of atrium, which is uh, a chronic atrial regurgitation and dilatation of the aortic annulus. So uh, again, we know all uh, about this thing. Uh, these slides, very busy slides, is there on the slides, from, uh, there on the internet as well. I'm not going to bore you with this. But uh, secondary mitral regurgitation, Mitra clip is only offered once the patient has failed goal-directed medical therapy. Very important. And we need to select our patients based on the COAP trial. If the patient fills into the criteria of the COAP trial, the patient is going to do better with Mitra clip. But if patient is something like a Mitra FR trial patient, patient might not do very well with the Mitra clip. So what are these EF between 20 to 50 percent? But most important, LV and systolic dimension should be less than 70 mm. So you don't want to treat an LV which is like a football. So views for mitral clip, bicable, four chamber, two chamber, three chamber LVOT, right and left pulmonary vein. So with these, I'm also going to explain you why we need these views because we're going to do a transeptal puncture. The transeptal puncture is very important for uh, mitral clip procedure to be successful. So these are the standard views. We look at the BICOM, 3D and FAST, and the LVOT view. These are the structures, you know, medial to lateral. Uh, we need to understand the echo anatomy, the fluoroscopic anatomy, and the echo cardiologist who is talking to us. And when we talk to them, we need to talk in the same language. So A1, A2, A3, P1, P2, P3, what structures are seen in BICOM, what structures are seen in LVOT, zero degree, three views. So this, this is the slide which tells us all those relationships. How it is done? Step one, transeptal puncture, very important. So it should be around four to 4.5 centimeters. Sometimes for a functional MR, we can also puncture between 3.5 to four. Sometimes if it's very difficult to get the adequate height, then there are certain other maneuvers which we do with a catheter to achieve that height. But you see a bicable view, which is going to show you whether you are superior, inferior, or right in the mid, and the post short axis view, which is going to tell us we are posterior or not. So in order to gain the height, we go clockwise with the transeptal system. So you go posterior. When you go posterior, you go away from mitral valve and that's how you achieve the height. And then this TE picture is very important because this is a short axis view where you advance the guide catheter into the left atrium. Now steering down to the mitral valve level. So these are certain uh, terminologies which we use when we do a mitral clip. So what happens is when you steer down, there's a Coumadin ridge. Coumadin ridge is just above the uh, left atrial appendage and the pulmonary vein. So you, you ha this has to be done under vision and you make sure you don't scratch or uh, cause damage to the left uh, atrial wall. So bypassing the Coumadin ridge, get to the level of the mitral annulus. What then? Then we orient the clip and align the clip arms at 90 degrees to the mitral commission. So somehow this slide is not trained. But the 3DT is very important. There was a question, can we do a mitral clip without a 3DT? No. Uh, somebody has to be a super expert in doing a transgastric view. But mitral NFA, the NFAS view, 3D NFAS view of the mitral valve is important, where you align your clip uh, and look at the perpendicularity. So clip positioning, there are three uh, views where you look at the clip. One is the BICOM view, where the clip is bisecting the jet or not, and then the LVOT view, and very important, 
is a 3D NFAS. And here you can see we're looking at the trajectory and uh, what we are looking at in this view is, is the clip directed to the apex? So if the clip is directed to the apex and if it is bisecting the regurgitation jet, uh, you are in the right plane. So we go ahead and cross the uh, mitral valve and then open the clip arms. The opening depends on what clip you are using. Now there's an, uh, there's an NTR, there's an XTR and now G4 clip which is an NTW, XTW, these are the clips which are available to us. And you can see the clip arms are open. We pull back the clip and let the AML and the posterior mitral leaflet rest on the clip arms. Once we are happy, we're going to drop the grippers and close the clip and look at the mitral regurgitation. So what is the final assessment? How do we know that this is the end of the procedure? We look at the mitral valve gradient, pulmonary flow, very important. Adequate insertion, you don't want a single leaflet detachment. You want to be sure that adequate amount of the leaflet is inside the clip arms. You look at the ASD shunt and you assess whether an additional clip is required or not. So the most important thing is, if you can see here, is the pulmonary vein. So if you can appreciate in the, um, I don't have a pointer, but if you can appreciate in the figure on the left side, there's no systolic <coughs> flow. The entire flow is diastolic. And on the right side, there's both systolic and diastolic. So majority of the flow from the pulmonary vein to the atria happens during the systole. So systole means LV systole when the atria is in diastole and the, uh, uh, the AV rim goes down to the LV. So this, this tells us that the mitral, the mitral regurgitation uh, has been clinically vanished. So we are not looking at zero reduction in mitral regurgitation. If you look at the COAP trial, more than 50% reduction in the mitral uh, regurgitation was adequate to help these patients suffering from functional MR. How do we measure the leaflet insertion adequacy? You look, measure the leaflet length first, and then once the clip is implanted, then you measure the length of the leaflet from the tenting position. So you know how much amount of leaflet is inside the clip. And then we assess the shunt flow. Here you can see a shunt which is from left to right. So we don't close these shunts as pointed out by Professor Seward as well and we leave these patients uh, uh, as it is, until unless patient has got a right to left hand. So here's a 3DT which shows two clips which have been implanted and a residual uh, minimal tricuspid regurgi uh, mitral regurgitation. Just an example, post-CABG patient, severe mitral regurgitation, one clip was implanted and you can see double orifice mitral valve and uh, uh, no mitral regurgitation. This is just one example of a degenerative MR. As I said, degenerative MR is better treated with surgery and not with clip. But here is an 82-year-old octogenarian with a mitral annular calcification and an A to P to prolapse. So standard, we do a septal puncture, a 3D TE, and you can see severe mitral regurgitation, and one clip was implanted uh, in this mitral annular calcium. In the interest of time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just show you one more case severe mitral regurgitation, functional MR, and you can see torrential MR, a T is going on, a 3D T, and uh, no mitral regurgitation after implantation of, a trivial mitral regurgitation after implantation of a clip. And remember, sometimes, you know, you can underassess the residual MR because patient is under general anesthesia. So you can raise the blood pressure, give isoprenaline, increase the heart rate, and also assess uh, the mitral regurgitation. And this is how it looks like on a 3D T, uh, clip which is deployed and residual mitral regurgitation which is trivial to mite. Thank you very much for the kind attention. <coughs> Excellent. That was uh, very concise. Uh, Horse, uh, what's your experience on these uh, mitral clips? What are the kind of patients you choose? Well, that was a, an excellent presentation. So with all steps uh, explained very carefully. <coughs> so it's, uh, it has become a standard of care, of course, in, in Europe. And uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering what the place of uh, mitral valve implantation will be, be looking at the results of mitral clip. And Eberhard certainly has a comment on that. Uh, yes, I think uh, what we are treating in our country is more of a functional MR. You know, we, we come across cases for degenerative MR. In my own practice, I'm turning down degenerative MR for mitral clip because actually surgeon will do a good job. But for functional MR, uh, there are hardly any surgeries which are happening in our country. Uh, so I think a functional MR clip or a repair therapy will always be better than a replacement. Pradeep, yeah? Go ahead. Oh. 
I, I think uh, mitoclip will remain the standard of care in these patients. And uh, I, uh, well, the, the problem is, I mean, functional MRF is usually very easy to treat with mitoclip. But what happens if mitoclip fails, if you have uh, residual uh, insufficiency and so on? And, and I think uh, uh, the future will be mitral valve uh, implantation techniques where we can overcome the uh, issues of a clip in place, and there are some projects working on that. You know, mitral clip is unbelievably safe. Um, we don't like the residual MR with the clip and the future issue, like, you know, what's going to happen in three, four, five years if it fails. TMVR looks fascinating, but the reality is they're not, vast majority of candidates, uh, like patients are not candidates. At our center, we have five different TMVR trials ongoing, 85 to 90 percent screen failure rate for each of those TMVRs. So uh, MitraClip, I think the ease of use, the safety, and universal applicability is very attractive. We wish there was a tool that can, you know, can be a bailout if MitraClip fails. That will be, be great. Just one comment regarding the uh, indication. Everybody has to follow the co-op criteria because that's in the guidelines. But I think the concept uh, may be wrong because we are talking about a vicious circle, which means a bad LV function, then increasing MR, then even worse LV function. So theoretically, it makes sense for me to intervene earlier, not so late. But we need more data to do that. I think that's a very good uh, thought which you uh, just said. Uh, it also comes to our mind before the patient develops complications of bipartite, renal failure, uh, all those things, maybe treating an MR. And I mean, the differences between my FR study and the co-op trial was not only the patient selection. Uh, so actually, we don't have any data for uh, uh, functional MR in an earlier stage. Might have uh, technical issues, uh, training issues, and many other things. So it's not only the patient selection which made the difference. So if you pick up your patients very early in their disease, it may be more difficult for you to prove the superiority of the technique. So that's the challenge, I think. Uh, uh, for, comment over there, Dr. Uh, Prashant. Question for uh, Professor Siebert, since he is a faculty uh, for. Your mic, is it on? I can't hear. Uh, question for Professor Siebert, in the faculty for China Web Hongzhou. How is the experience of Dragonfly and what are the salient differentiating features between the GPO devices and Dragonfly? <coughs> I, I could not hear that. Can you repeat? Can you speak louder? As Dragon, I said that. Dragonfly. I, I, I have not used the Dragonfly, so I don't know. I've not used it either. No. <coughs> Right. Dr. Hazra. So nowadays, uh, you know, some people are doing this mitral clip for post myocardial infarction mitral reconstitution. The problem is the LA doesn't have much time for the remodel. So you have a small LA, it's very difficult to get the height of four and five centimeters. It's very essential to go into the biggest advantage of doing this is MBS less than four millimeter motorcycle. So you can do it, do away with single clip in post MI vis a vis functional MR uh, where you have white annulus, more MBA, and if you go central or lateral medial, you can do away with one clip or two clips. So my question is, what are the things you should follow in post MI MR where the LA dimension or the height is not ideal? So I'm going to share my small experience, uh, but we can have input from the experts. The first mitral which I did was two years ago for an exactly similar kind of patient. 77 year old female, posterior wall MI, late presentation, severe mitral regurgitation, uh, put on balloon perm, surgical turn down. So we ended up putting a mitral clip, but the challenge was exactly the same. LA was small, we had to compromise with the height, we, were, we could puncture somewhere around 3.5, but there are certain maneuvers on the handle, you give an anterior A knob and it, the whole guide catheter lifts up but goes posteriorly, so you go uh, come, uh, do more counterclock. Then you add more uh, negative to the uh, guide system, the guide catheter, and then you can gain some height. So there are certain maneuvers which you can do with the whole system. But you, know, you have to be very careful with the post MI um, uh, severe MR patient. Uh, two reasons, if there is a rupture of a papillary muscle, it can be very challenging because that whole uh, tissue will not allow you to put the clip at the right place. Uh, second, uh, we also did one patient with a post MI uh, severe MR, but we lost the patient to sepsis. Uh, that's because the patient was hospitalized for too long 
though the MR was corrected, but patient has fungal sepsis and we lost the patient. So post MIBSR we have to be very careful. So <coughs> Rajneesh is here, we had a post MI patient who had a VSR and uh, VSR and he was on ECMO for one week, VSR was repaired. Uh, he still continued to have symptoms because of severe MR. Uh, we could clip him and he did very well. He's on follow up for six months now, doing extremely well. The second thing about the height, majority of patients will have to give you that height. If you look at the normal dimensions of the area, on the black view it is about 4.5. So the height is always more. So it generally gives you that, even if it is an acute MR. That's more about the uh, thin part of the septum. So you can easily get a height if you're trying to puncture the thick part of the septum. Yeah, right. Uh, but right now, because you don't have the radio frequency system, though you can ablate the whole catheter, put the energy to the catheter into it, but uh, we are trying to puncture the thin part of the septum. So the cautery can be made to yeah, a very good use. Yeah. Yeah. Any more Dr. comments? I, Rajneesh, yeah. yeah. Dr. Rao, if you can just, uh, I have just one question. I mean, I want to ask you, is there any limitation for the age, I mean, where you can put a mitral clip? Uh, so age is, age is not a limitation. I would, I would always assess whether the patient, so I'm talking about functional MR. Functional MR, if a patient is undergoing a cabbage, yes, the patient will undergo cabbage plus mitral valve repair, which uh, certainly can do a good job with endoloplasty or a replacement. But we're looking at a patient with functional MR who is actually a non-surgical candidate in majority of time. Degenerative MR would still undergo surgery unless we have died. So we have done young uh, mitral clips also as young as a uh, 44 year old patient because patient was post renal transplant and patient had severe MR. Uh, so I don't think age would be a criteria to put a mitral clip. It just an uh, extension to that. I had a patient who was, she was 16 years old. She had severe MR, 20% ejection fraction, dilated cardiomyopathy, a fit candidate for, I, mean, I would say, mitral clip. Couldn't, I, mean, I couldn't really take her for the surgery because uh, that would have not really helped her. She was waiting for her transplant. We have put her in the transplant list. LVAT she cannot afford. So will she be the right person for this? Yes, so there, there was a trial. There was a trial. Yeah. So, yeah, so there, there was a paper, paper which was published, patients who are on heart transplant list, one third of them after mitral clip did not require a heart transplant. But as I was saying, if this LV is 7.5, she might yeah, I refer to him, she yes. might better, she might do better with a heart transplant, but sometimes mitral clip can serve as a bridge to transplant uh, if you don't have an LVAC. Yeah, but, uh, but waiting may be too long, I mean, she may not just be surviving the transplant, so waiting for this. Thank you, Ravinder. Uh, these were two very uh, beautifully placed and on the spur I'm, of the I'm, moment you were able to pull out from I'm your hat. I'm going to charge size at least for this. <laughs> yeah, so you can bill him. <clears throat> He'll send you back by a chartered aircraft now. <laughs> Thanks. And now let's move forward to uh, Pradeep Yadav. Now, the tricuspid valve is something which is generating a lot of interest. Now. Things have been done in mitral valve area. And uh, Eberhardt has also a lot of insights on this. So let's hear out Pradeep and then we'll take Eberhardt's uh, inputs on this. All right, thanks a lot. Thank you, Ravinder, for setting up the stage with the trick valve. You mentioned that leaflet technologies will win when, it, when they're available. So I'll show you two technologies, one replacement and one repair, and let's see uh, what do you think. So tricuspid tear, tricuspid clip, two different devices, what have they shown? that vast majority of patients still have some degree of regurgitation left. Only a quarter of patients, one in four, will have mild or no TR. Otherwise, they will be left with moderate or severe tricuspid regurgitation. So that's why there is a need for tricuspid replacement options. I'm going to show you a case of Evoke, which is the front runner in these replacements. It is a nitinol frame. It's an Edwards Life Sciences uh, prosthesis. It's a nitinol frame, self-expanding, that has nine anchors atraumatic. It basically captures the leaflet of the tricuspid valve, and therefore you don't need too much oversizing at the annular level. But the annulus, the oversizing does help in anchoring. It comes in three different sizes, 44, 48, and 52 millimeter valve, and it's a 28 French transfemoral delivery system. It's a bovine pericardial tri-leaflet valve. 
This is a typical patient, one of our patients from the trial, 81-year-old female with a very symptomatic severe tricuspid regurgitation. She had a history of surgical mitral annuloplasty. And a few years ago, we had done triline on her. Triline was a, a suture-based cinching annuloplasty of the tricuspid valve. She did well after a few years after that, but had recurrent of TR and was now back with us failed medical therapy and had a pacemaker lead across the tricuspid valve. These are the basic transthoracic images just showing you severe TR, nothing special. If you want to start doing tricuspid intervention, start getting yourself familiar to the TEE views. These are the mid-esophageal views, just showing you four-chamber view, um, severe TR. And then the inflow outflow view. Inflow is right there, tricuspid. You see the pledget of the triline in the LA flopping, pulmonic valve on this side, and severe tricuspid regurgitation right by the pacemaker lead. CT analysis, again, these bright things right there are the triline aniloplasty from the past, and you see a pacemaker lead traversing through. So this is the case uh, summary slide for the valve. The valve annulus was around 48 to 46 millimeters, which gave 8 and 13% oversizing for this valve. During the pre-procedure analysis, we do get these schematic diagrams of how much flexion on the catheter are you going to apply, what is the uh, what is the relationship of the IVC to the annulus, because that predicts how much secondary flex you're going to do it. And there's only a limitation of the uh, depth that you can implant, so it gives you an idea of papillary head. Obviously, if you are too deep, the anchors aren't going to get caught in the pap muscle. And when you release it, it may go ventricular. So all, after all the analysis, you move, if it looks okay, you move forward with the case. These are the intraprocedural images, and just to orient, you see a mitral annuloplasty ring, you see um, the triline pledgets there, pacemaker lead, and this is a steerable agilis sheath through which we advance a safari wire all the way to the RV apex. And then on echo, you're just seeing um, pacemaker lead on this posterior side, and this is the actual safari wire. Once the safari is placed at the RV apex, you advance this catheter, which has a flexion knob, so gently flex and advance, just keeping the wire in position. After that, you, you align your catheter nicely. So in this view, posterior is on this side where you see a pacemaker lead, this is anterior. And then on, in the other view, you see septal on this side and lateral on this side. And then again, a short axis view, you wanna see the catheter right in the middle. Pacemaker would be right here in the postroceptal commissure. This is anteroceptal, septal leaflet is right here anterior leaflet on this side. Once your trajectory looks fairly parallel like this, you start opening the anchors. These bright spots right here are the anchors. The key thing here is before you start opening, make sure you're enough height. You have enough height. You're not at the level of pap muscle. Otherwise, it will get tangled in pap. If it looks good, you keep opening and the leaflets are above the anchors. You continuously check in different views. This is how the floral looks like. The anchors are flipped. And once again, it's a very heavy echo-driven, TEE-driven procedure. You um, go into these MPR images and you cut through different anchors and just check in that two-dimensional view just to make sure all the leaflets are above the anchors. If, you, if all looks good, you keep opening. That's the full ventricular expansion. The anchors are fully flipped and then if that looks good, then it's just an opening of the atrial side. It's a self-expanding nitinol. There is no pacing required. There is no hemodynamic collapse. There is no inflow issues. You just very calm uh, procedure. This is the valve fully deployed in short axis and the long axis. As you can see, the outer frame is where that 44, 48, 52 millimeter dimensions comes. Inner valve, the valve actually is a 28.5 millimeter um, bovine pericardium. This is the final TE with complete resolution of the tricuspid regurg. You see a mild little trace puff of TR right near the pacemaker lead. And this is a 30-day transthoracic echo. Re relatively tall valve, so you do see this giant thing in the right ventricle. 
a big shadow, mean gradient of around 2.5. All these patients have to be on anticoagulation at least for six months as part of the trial protocol. We have been uh, utilizing ICE in more recent cases, not as a standalone, but as an adjunct with TEE, just to familiarize ourselves, just to start building the experience with ICE in these New York catheters. This is an image from a 4D volume Siemens ICE probe, just showing you a lot of uh, tricuspid regurgitation at baseline, and then finally a very well done implant with nicely moving leaflets. So TR reduction is very reproducible. As you see, this is Tricent was the early feasibility study and 98% of the time you'll get none to trace TR at 30 days. So very powerful therapy, but it's not available right now. It's being studied as part of the pivotal study, the Tricent 2 study. It's randomizing patients for tricuspid valve replacement versus optimal medical therapy. And the endpoints are at two years. Uh, we still, the trial's ongoing. We're hoping to complete it sometimes next year. The largest experience still date on tricuspid device is on TIER, whether it's Abbott's uh, MitraClip or Edwards Life Sciences Pascal. That's where a lot of the experience is. I'm just gonna show you a quick case. Um, if, now this case is using off-label MitraClip. So MitraClip, as you know, is designed for, for the mitral side. There is a dedicated triclip, which is still not available in the US. So we are still left to using MitraClip as an off-label basis. And the, what, you're she, what you're seeing in this video is there is a blue to blue line. And those of you who do mitroclips, you know that for mitral side, you match that blue to blue. Whereas if you want to stay on the tricuspid side, you intentionally want to miskey it. You want to rotate your, your CDS, your clip, 90 degrees towards you. And, and that way you can, you can use the knobs differently. The other difference that you have to do is, as compared to mitral is, look at the guiding position. The guide box, usually the plus minus knob is on the top for the mitral side, whereas on the tricuspid side, you keep it on the bottom. So 180 degree turn on the guide box, 90 degree miskey on the clip. You could do 180 degrees. There are centers who do not miskey at all. In our practice, we like to miskey. Um, that way your A knob on the CDS flexes and brings the clip to the appropriate um, trajectory. Once you've, once you've uh, got the clip down to the annulus, you open, check your grippers, and then position to the clip over the area of interest. In this view, posterior will be down here and anteroseptal will be up here. You also look at the 3D view and orient your clip exactly how you wanna go most common of these jets are entroseptal or, or central. The highest chance of success for a clip is in the entroseptal. So early on in the experience, maybe you want to start entroseptal. Once your position is finalized, you close the clip and enter into the valve just below the leaflets. And we want to go close just so that we don't get tangled into the cords. We then switch to transgastric short axis just to make sure you are in the position where you want to be. Like for example, in this transgastric short axis view, entroseptal commissure is this, septal leaflet is here, anterior leaflet's there, and if you're happy that's where you're, you want to go, you open the clip and grasp the leaflets back in that midesophageal view, drop the grippers, and then close. Deploy the clip, always check a gradient, and bring on the second clip if you still have residual tricuspid regurgitation and uh, close the clip. This is the final result after two uh, XTW clips in the tricuspid valve. A, a quick word on ICE, do we, how frequently use it? We've gone back and forth. We used to use it almost exclusively in every single case, but now we're a little more selective. By that I mean that we will start off with a TEE, but a lot of times TE will not show you the leaflet grasping. So the final moment when you want to drop the gripper and make sure you have leaflet insertion, that is sometimes challenging with the TE. So if that's the case, we'll just pull out the ice for that maneuver.
And it turns out that almost uh, 30 to 50 percent of the times we'll end up using an ice. And these are typical ice images. Uh, now, let, let, I apologize. These are not the typical ice images. This is a very nice view. A lot of times we have to struggle to get this view with ice. So in conclusion, tricuspid replacement with evoke at least eliminates TR. We still have to see how that translates into clinical outcomes. It seems very promising, could be a game changer, and the pivotal trial against optimal medical therapy is ongoing and expected to complete next year. Tricuspid TR is challenging because of various issues, multiple leaflets of the tricuspid valve, challenging imaging, but is doable with acceptable or maybe even good results in select anatomies and pivotal trials are ongoing, data is awaited. Thank you. So very, very nice overview, both the technologies. I'm sure each would have specific selection criteria right now, given the limitations. Ever heard you have uh, any views on the trackers per trial because yeah first of all congratulations um, very very nice summary of the two possibilities that we have uh, in today's scenarios a the the tier and the and the replacement um, and uh, the role of ice which is obviously on the forefront of, of imaging its role has yet to be defined um, I, I would like to make a few comments, even though I, I try to uh, hold myself back or hold my horses back, because I, I'm still a little bit puzzled of um, the mitral clip situation, but now we're talking about tricuspid, I was holding myself back on the mitral. I think there's a difference between mitral clip and, and, um, and, and tricuspid clips. Uh, for the reason that the tricuspid valve is even more complex than the mitral valve. The imaging is more difficult. The results are depending a little bit on who you talk to and um, uh, what, what forum you are, you are, you are sitting at. Um, the results, as you said, there's always some tricuspid insufficiency left. If that's what we want, um, then we are probably doing okay as far as symptoms is concerned, or symptoms are concerned. But we know this in medical school. If you have a volume overloaded ventricle, right or left, right worse than left, and you reduce the volume, patients will feel better. We know that. But if that's the long-term strategy, I'm not sure, and uh, on, on, on either side. Having said that, I think the tricuspid replacement situation is, will have a different role than the mit mitral replacement, um, because I think there we don't have many other good options, at least not for the time being, and interventional cardiologists like these solutions. Uh, as you said, it's incredibly safe, and it is very hard to beat the safety issues both on the mitral and on the tricuspid side. If we can adapt the tricuspid results to what we want, I question that, and I honestly doubt. Because if, if we, we always have to look at what surgery we can offer to a patient, granted, on the tricuspid side, the surgeons it's a definitely an undertreated uh, situation uh, by, by the surgeons. The surgeons don't like to get into the tricuspid, and the surgical results there are not very good, as we all know. So, you know, the bar is lower on the, on the right side than on the, low, uh, on the left side. I think Evoc is quite interesting. I think you also have a topaz. You did also topaz, if I'm not mistaken. We haven't done right? yet. No, yeah. We did intrepid, though. Yeah, so, so, I mean, they have a lot of experience, obviously, now with these valves. Um, I, but I think the replacement on tricuspid does have a, a future. Uh, the role of tear, to be frank, um, uh, I, I'm not sure on the long term, on, on the long run. We know it's eliminating uh, the, the tricuspid insufficiency successfully and reproducibly. Uh, if, you, if you replace the valve, particularly the ones with a low footprint, to pass Intrepid and evoke really promising valves. Um, initially, I think uh, you had the Navigate situation uh, or you Navigate results to horse, which you can maybe talk about a little bit. On the TI side, I'm not so sure whether that's the way we should go. 
still looking for still looking for something that we painfully experience both on the left and on the right side. Interventional cardiologist after the TAVA success thought it's going to be a quick run on the mitral and tricuspid. We know that's wrong. Uh, until today, until today, we don't have a good annuloplasty approach, uh, either for tricuspid or for uh, for mitral. And the role of, of annuloplasty in surgery is very well defined. And all the procedures that they do on the mitral side are being supported by, by an annulus support. And we don't have that. Now, I don't question the results of the CLIP and uh, of COAPT, but I think we have to be careful if that's, the one, if that's what we want. On the, my, on the left side, we deal with old patients, high risk and extreme risk. Whether or not we can lower the bar to moderate risk or even low risk remains to be seen. Um, and, you know, we don't exactly know what moderate risk is in, um, in, in surgery. On the, on the right side, I think the, the, the way is much faster and actually probably also easier. So thank you very, very much for this very insightful um, presentation. Thank you very much, Pradeep. A big hand for you. And so now we move to one of the very important presentations of this yeah, session. Nice. And uh, can I invite Dr. Ranjan Shetty, who is a pioneer in LA appendage closure devices in the country, who's probably done the largest number and continues to talk to people on this device. And then we have other experts, global experts, over here with us to discuss it out. So serious, no? Thank you. Yeah, right I'm really happy to be <laughs> part of this conference. And after listening to a much more mm. complex intervention, LA looks very no. simple uh, compared to tricuspid wall or mitral wall. The challenge is why is it not really picking up in the country to the extent probably it should uh, pick up. So this was a case in box. So one of the conference which we shot a video, so I was, uh, 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 was I will be showing it. It's going to be just a five minute uh, video. So here is a 74-year male who had come with recurrent CVA, had a ischemic uh, embolic stroke to pons, had left hemiparesis, chadavas 4, has blood flow, had uh, multiple episodes of severe iron deficiency, um, anemia which required uh, blood transfusion, also has yeah. IHD and EF is 48%. So yeah, let me play this. So here, uh, like any other intervention here, I think there are two, three steps which we need to be very careful. One is the septal puncture, second is sizing, and finally the delivery of the device itself. The septal puncture, I think we have had a lot of discussion about septal puncture. What we know now is I think all of us need to learn transesophageal guided septal puncture because that's what you need for almost all intervention and it helps. I'm, I know that most Indians here have a lot of experience with BMV, but we may have to unlearn those experience and learn to do septal puncture using, uh, uh, you know, transesophageal guidance. So here there's only a venous puncture. Uh, septal puncture is done in AP view using a transesophageal guidance. So you need two views here and we need to mark the site of septal puncture. So for LAA, it is posterior and inferior. So we need bicable view, which is right now shown in your screen. And we are in the middle part of the septum here. This may be okay for mitra clip. For LA, we need to be a little more inferior. That means we need to be more closer to uh, uh, the IVC. And then you ask your echocardiographer to show aortic will, and you need to go posterior here. To go posterior, all you need to do is turn your catheter in by clockwise. So clockwise rotation takes it posterior. You can see it in TE that it's actually going away from iota. And just look at the angio. In angio, the view looks abnormal, you know. It's not the view which you are comfortable. It's not the view which you use for, uh, you know, balloon mitral septostomy. So in AP, it looks a little odd, but you need to go by your transesophageal. You can see the tenting, and here we have already entered into the uh, left atrium. The next thing what you do is half the heparin is actually given even before you do the septal puncture because this puncture is safer. Unlike BMV where we do it only after the septal puncture. And the next step is to measure LA pressure and if it is low, give some fluid. Sometimes the LA pressure rises, sometimes it doesn't. But you take that into information when you actually calculate the device. 
So on the uh, in the T image right now, you, you see that once we have punctured, we have put the wire in the pulmonary vein because most of the exchanges are done, they're better done in pulmonary vein. You could do it in the appendage, but you need to be careful. I know uh, Professor Horsever does all the exchanges in uh, appendage, but you need to be like him to do that. So otherwise, it's safer to do these exchanges in the uh, pulmonary vein. And once we do in the pulmonary vein, we, uh, you know, the pigtail is put. So general rule is appendage is very, very delicate. So don't, you know, do too much meddling inside the appendage. Don't allow your catheters to move in and out. It's better if you have a pigtail, which is reasonably atraumatic. So here, we, when we started, I think uh, we were in the uh, upper pulmonary vein. The pigtail was leading it. The sheath was below and we pulled the whole system down and then we enter the appendage. So now if you see the pigtail, uh, you know, is in the appendage and we have taken an anjo in the appendage. So as usual here, you realize this patient has intermittent AF, but there are two lobes which are present, which is very common. I think around, uh, you know, around 50% people actually have two lobes, not single lobe. And among these two lobes, you need to choose the uppermost lobe to start your deployment. The same thing can be seen in uh, ECHO and uh, in 135 you uh, can actually see the position of the catheter and this is the, we are planning to deploy watchman here and you see that the, uh, you know, now we are in the upper lobe with the pigtail and the sheath which is a 14 French sheath is already there. The sheath is considerably anti-clockwise and it is held there and the injection there shows the likely position. The first marker is 21, second is 27, third is 33. So you get a fair idea where your device is likely to fall. But I think the most important thing is uh, the sizing probably is not done based on Anjo. It is predominantly done in ECHO in multiple views. So at level of circumflex, you measure, you draw a perpendicular line and that becomes what we call as landing zone which is not too perfect, but that's the measurement you take. You also measure at uh, the depth at that point. You take this measurement at 0, 20, you know, 0, 45, 90 and 135. And typically you upsize by 4 to 5 millimeter. You could, with a watchman device, you have more liberty. You could upsize more, The especially if the depth, depth permits, it makes sense to upsize more. And when you do that, the ceiling is better. You know, the peri device leak, what, what we are worried sometime nowadays, it's not a big problem uh, because we tend to upsize more, especially if there is depth. We accept little more shouldering and we accept little more upsizing. So now if you see on the screen, the device is already in place. The, we have put the 27 uh, watchman device here and it is kept in. You can see us uh, connecting it and the anti-clockwise, that's the trick here, probably clockwise with septal puncture and anti-clockwise while deploying the device is what we need. Anti-clockwise makes it look anterior superior so that when you really unsheath the device, you don't want it to fall down into the appendage, you want it to uh, position upward. So you can see the unsheathing now. So slowly, once we connect both the device, at this point you connect, you don't push it any further. If you see my hand there, we actually get it backward and then you start unsheathing. So watchman comes as pre-connected pre and you need to de-air. Now it is a very eco-intense, anti-clockwise is a rule here and you slowly start unsheathing the device and you can see the unsheathing happening and you can see the device slightly getting deployed. So you started with the uppermost lock, you have maintained the anti-clockwise uh, torsion and you are unsheathing now. As you are unsheathing, you will be able to see the device uh, now getting, uh, uh, you know, released. It's still not fully released at this point. Continue to unsheath with anti-clockwise torque and uh, the device gets deployed uh, now. Eco becomes extremely important, especially transition. Well, if you see here, you can actually see the device getting deployed. You see a slight shoulder. Shoulder means projection into the LA, which is acceptable because uh, there is a mesh cover which is present. You look for compression at this point. We, it's called pass criteria. P is for position. Most of the device should be within circumflex. A is for anchoring. You see it is fine. S is size. You want it to be, uh, you know, compressed at least 
15 to 20 percent maybe more if you have taken a bigger device and the last is for any you know leak you can't seal is the last yes and you may you have to bring down the uh, uh, you know your color gain and see that there is no peri device leak in today's era we don't accept too much peri device leak although trials allowed up to three to five millimeter but we wanted zero in most of the cases and it is possible because over the period uh, the you know the if you see the protect af the success was 87 percent whereas current registry success is 98 percent so most las now can be closed with the understanding which we have and once we realize that it is positioned right as you don't have to do any angio but uh, you know most intervention cardiologists are not comfortable unless you do angio you could do angio see where the uh, dye goes and you just uh, release at uh, uh, this point and uh, uh, post device uh, therapy depends on what we started and what is the indication it's not must to give warfarin to everybody if you have used the device as an alternative to warfarin then yes because both protect prevail actually used anticoagulation for 45 days did a te and showed that there is no peri device leak but if patient doesn't tolerate anticoagulant even dual antiplatelet is fine because device starts working immediately the clots can form but they can't come out because of the mesh once it is endothelized it is very safe after that you don't see uh, much problem. So, in this case, there was a significant device compression. It was a 27 device, but it's 17.6, which is good. There was no peri device leak and there was no residual uh, flow. Uh, so thank you for the question. Excellent. You, know, you can walk a person through the <laughs> procedure and yes. make them feel that they are actually doing it. Great. Horse, the master on LA appendage. <laughs> <laughs> So no, excellent, excellent presentation. I think this was the old watchman, right? You yes, don't have, this is the old so the new watchman <laughs> flex is really a big difference. It has the same name, but it's completely different. The implantation technique is much more safe. Yeah. So this will move is moving the field forward. Yeah. By the way, like the tri clip is a complete, as you know, it's completely different to the to the mitre clip in with off label use. Uh, so um, uh, you mentioned that I prefer to exchange with the wire in the appendage. It's always that's an ongoing debate since 10 years. So I'm exchanging over a wire in the left atrial appendage. Many others do it in the pulmonary vein. Yes. Then those who do it in the pulmonary vein, like you say, oh, it's uh, more safe. Yes. Then my next question is how many perforations have you seen with the wire in the left atrial appendage? And then you probably say never have seen one. And I say, oh, I always use it. I've never seen a perforation as well. So I think both techniques are good and both techniques are pretty safe. Uh, uh, I mean, the. Uh, Talking about the future uh, regarding the devices, I think we are moving uh, into a way that we don't need actually imaging at all in, in the future because, and that's already done by the Watchman Flex because basically you can close all appendages with the largest size because it's compressible. So that means you don't need exact measurements anymore, whether it's angiography or CT or TE, doesn't matter. And there are some other new techniques on the horizon who also will make any measurements uh, unnecessary in the future. Excellent presentation, Dr. Shetty. Could you, could you please comment on the recapturability of these devices? I know the flex and the old one has got slight difference in yes. that. It's uh, quite <coughs> recapturable to be honest. And, uh, but if you go by the IFU, once you fully recapture, you're not supposed to use it. I've seen uh, Professor Horseman doing it multiple times. I've done it many times. It's almost completely recapturable. And if it's here, we reuse it when we recap. You don't even take it out, you just recapture. Because what we are advised is start as distally as possible. But once you do that, if the depth is too much, it's sometimes you fall short. You know, you're more inside the appendage than what you want to be. So you could do a partial recapture at that time, bring it back, and start, uh, uh, you know, deploying again but there are times we had to do full recapture but it's again the highest yeah Dr. Hazar. yeah and nowadays you know we are seeing a lambre device also lambre is uh, one device the embolism rate almost zero and it has got a special size so whatever lobes you see 
Yes. Beyond this, doesn't matter. Yes. So what you are to close, so you close the mouth and 10 millimeter. Yes. Rest is immaterial for watchman flex. <coughs> watchman flex can just walk in. Yes. Now, agile seat is also coming with, uh, this is introduced in US with eyes guidance. So agile seat, you can make a, like posture infill is not always possible sometimes for the beginners. And some people are hesitant to do a T. So if you puncture like the BMB way, still you can manage to enter either pulmonary vein or the appendage. I prefer appendage way direct. If it goes, wherever it goes, it goes to the appendage, take it. Same. If it goes to the pulmonary vein, take it. So this agility is also is a value addition for difficult entry, especially thick septum, AS device there, or AF device there, which is for atrial shunt. So this flexibility of the uh, I mean, sheet is also going to help uh, for new generation. Uh, Dr. Ranjan, a word about uh, the cost is a big constraint in our country and watchman comes at a price. So just a word about the, the Emplarger emulate is yes. now available yeah. to us. So just touch upon yeah. it, we have vast experience even on yes, that device. Yes. Yeah, I think, yeah, you are uh, right, uh, Dr. Chandra. So, uh, you know, the watchman is almost double the price as other devices. Now there are three other devices which are available. <coughs> ACP is available, but they're facing out. There is AMOLED, which is now come, and there is LAMRE, which we already discussed. So these devices are softer, easy to use, and uh, the skill required is lesser. The fundamental difference would be the way these devices are devised, you know. They're different from Watchman. Watchman is one which you have to go inside and start deploying. So it's more like a body-based device. LA has a body, LA has a neck. So all other devices are neck-based and they usually have double protection. They have something to anchor and a lid which can close. So most of these uh, devices are like pacifier, you know, they have something to hold. There's also one more thing which holds. The sizing is different. It's same LA, but when you measure for Watchman and when you measure for ACP, AMOLED or Lambre is different. So you go from the ostium 10 millimeter inside and you measure at the level of circumflex but a different line you, know, you can think LA is like this in one you are measuring it here in another you are measuring it actually at the neck you oversize you don't oversize too much with this because it doesn't get compressed like watchman watchman I think you don't have to worry you could take if it is 21 you could even take 33 that's what uh, Dr. Horst was trying to say it gets compressed here if you take too big it gets ejected you know, it doesn't hold. So the oversizing gear may be only up to three to four millimeter. It's easy to deploy. You can even do if there is distal LA clot because it's practically a no touch technique. You can open the device in LA, go slightly in, again anti-clockers, but just be at the level of neck, at level of circumflex and anti-clockwise and start unsheathing the uh, device as it is. So it's much simpler to use, learning curve is uh, uh, easier and the seal is good. Lambre probably has, uh, you know, 99.5% of your LA can be closed with Lambre. Any LA you can close. So nowadays we don't do any pre-imaging, you know. Uh, there's no pre-imaging. Patient comes on table, we do a TE and whatever device you have, you have on the shelf, you're able to close almost all LA. Success is highest with Lambre. It's all other devices around 98%. So we don't ask people to do any CTE or pre-TE. It's all on table, which is which is done because we are able to close because of the that. Yeah, so just want to ask you, if there is any perforation, do you occlude this or do you require a surgical help to close yeah. that? Typically, you are, you are supposed to occlude it and wait and you are supposed to aspirate pericardial uh, this one. Because occlusion itself will lead to less, uh, it's a venous, uh, you know, perf, unless you have really torn the appendage, means you have gone beyond. That happens with the sheet, so that's why anything, the sheet movement in LA has to be very delicate and uh, be away from the walls of LA. Do you require anticoagulation for the for the device itself? Because yeah. it's also a foreign body. It's yeah, like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Almost all of them, it's like ASD device. So antiplatelet is what is recommended. That's all. Anticoagulation only if the patient can take anticoagulation for a short period, 45 days, only with watchmen. All other devices is just dual antiplatelet for 45 days, single for six months, and then it's up to you. But most of us continue after six months, single antiplatelet. Thank you very much, Ranjan. Yeah. This was, yeah. as as always, uh, expected. <clears throat> so, thank you very much.